Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cultivate's Equal Opportunity and the Law, an expert overview. Providing fair treatment to employees, regardless of their personal backgrounds, is obviously the right thing to do, but it's also the law. So we are going to be, in the next 45 minutes or so, sharing what every HR leader must know about complying with federal law in this very important area. I am personally extremely excited to introduce two gentlemen who I admire so much. Uh, first of all, Keith Sonderling. He was confirmed by the U.S. Senate with a bipartisan vote um, to be the commissioner of the U.S. Equal Opportunity Commission in 2020. Prior to his confirmation to the EEOC, Commissioner Sonderling served as the acting and deputy administrator of the Wage and Hour Division of the U.S. Department of Labor. Before joining the Department of Labor in 2017, Commissioner Sonderling practiced labor and employment law in Florida. Since joining the EEOC, one of Commissioner Sonderling's priorities is ensuring that artificial intelligence and new workplace technologies are designed and deployed consistent with long-standing civil rights laws. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Craig Lean. Craig serves on the advisory board of Eightfold and is a partner at k l Gates in Washington, D.C. He is formerly the director of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs at the U.S. Department of Labor. He also serves on various boards and committees, including the D.C. Advisory Committee for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. I'm so glad to have you both. I am very excited for this discussion. I think I'm going to learn a lot. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Alexandra Levitt, and I am a columnist for The Wall Street Journal and a workforce futurist who advises on the future of the workplace. So this is obviously an issue that is near and dear to my heart and one that I think we can all learn a lot about. I would like to start, um, Keith, with you if I could. Let's talk about the specifics of the federal law itself. Like, what are the most salient points that you think HR professionals should keep in mind when they are developing their own policies? Well, thank you. And that's a really great question. First, it's important to understand what we do here at the EEOC. The EEOC is the federal agency responsible for enforcing federal laws that make it illegal to discriminate in the workplace. Our mission is to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and advance equal opportunity for all in the workplace. So for HR professionals, we really deal with everything you deal with on a daily basis, including protecting employees and job applications from discrimination from race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation and gender identity, pregnancy, national origin, age, disability, and genetic information. So the laws we enforce here apply to all types of work situations, including hiring, firing, promotions, trainings, wages, benefits. It also prevents harassment and retaliation. So when you think of the EEOC, you're thinking about the big ticket items that you're dealing with as HR professionals, such as the Me Too movement, gender and pay equity issues in the workplace, age discrimination, and everything related to the vaccination policies, and now the future of work. So that is us. So Everything you're doing as HR professionals, we want to make sure you're doing right. You heard our mission. It's also, it's not just enforcement, it's to prevent. And how do you do that? The EEOC has issued numerous best practices to help you as HR professionals comply with these laws. But the key takeaway from for HR professionals is making sure that your commitment to equal opportunity and preventing discrimination starts at the top with your leadership. So committed and engaged leadership helps you as HR professionals do your job. So it needs to start at the top. And then from your perspective, preventing discrimination has to be consistent and you must demonstrate accountability across the organization. How do you do this? By strong and comprehensive policies and trusted and accessible complaint procedures for employees, as well as regular interactive training tailored for employees and managers throughout the organization. So as you know, there's no one size fits all approach and you need to protect employees from all these various laws. And it's more important now than ever with everything going on in the news post COVID, the HR issues are big ticket items now. They've really made it to the boardrooms and to C-level management. So your role is more than more important than ever. There's also a lot to keep track of. This is the one thing that, that I always think is overwhelming for HR professionals. It seems like we just keep adding more and more things that we have to keep track of. So would either one of you have any suggestions for, for how to keep up? with the number of regulations and, and, and even the vaccine. I mean, this is something, the mandates were, were something that did not exist 
a year and a half ago, and now it's something that we have to keep in mind when we're developing policy. Any tips for keeping ahead of everything or at least keeping up with everything? Well, I'll tell you what I uh, I tell clients and you know what I what I look at as a practitioner in the field who used to be the OFCCP director. I'm always looking to see, you know, what is the EOC publishing in terms of guidance? What is OFCCP publishing? You, you know, you really try to keep up to date. It's hard, like you said, because it's just it can be an overwhelming amount of different regulations, FAQs, information. You know, but one thing that I know Commissioner Sonderling has been well known for is trying to cut through all that and provide very helpful guidance, practical. And, you know, you can often get it on the, on the agency's websites. And in fact, the FAQ parts of those websites are some of the most helpful um, sub-regulatory guidance, guidance documents that exist. And I, I would start there, to be honest. I would go right to the website, look at the FAQs. One thing I've said uh, to the EOC and OFCCP is that more guidance would be helpful in the form of FAQs, in the form of specific situations, in the form of opinion letters. You know, those sort of situations where you have a hypothetical and you're trying to address a set of facts, those are the most useful to companies because then they can analogize to those situations. But we need to hear from you as HR professionals. You know what's going on in your industry. You know, I'm sitting here in Washington, D.C. with the flags behind me. We have to regulate the entire country. And there's very different issues depending on industry or where you are. But I really have encouraged in my time being here, how do we get to that easy to read guidance? How do we get to those FAQs? By hearing from all of you, from hearing about what those industry specific and regional issues are that the EEOC needs to clarify. And I really think that's our job and it's a change I've tried to make is really hearing from stakeholders across all different industries, across all different regions to see what are your issues and what can we do to help you because that's on us. And that's a role the federal government should take much more than just enforcing these laws. <laughs> you heard it here. Commissioner Sonderling wants to hear from us about what we're out there in the field seeing. Uh, you know, I'd love to see it in the AI field in particular. It would be great if there was more guidance from the EOC and OFCCP on artificial intelligence. Now, Commissioner Sonderling has been one of the leading government officials, perhaps the leading government official, in talking about artificial intelligence, which is wonderful. I used to do it as well when I was at OFCCP also. It's, it's definitely the wave of the future, but what would be really useful in the long run is if the EOC as a body and OFCCP as a body would publish FAQs that tell companies how best to use artificial intelligence. Because I'll tell you, that's, that's the present, that's the future, and artificial intelligence can really help companies make good employment decisions without bias, and that is really the goal. And that's the Wild West right now in terms of regulation. Nobody is sure what, what is the most ethical way to use these technologies. So I think a partnership between HR professionals and the government institutions is absolutely critical. So I'm going to move on to a question that I'm a little nervous asking, but I think it, it needs to be done. And that's I'm going to start with Craig this time. Craig, what do you think are some of the more common gotchas that organizations run into when they are trying to develop policy? Where have you seen organizations go wrong and how can we possibly prevent some of these negative outcomes that could occur? So both as a government uh, regulator and also now as a practitioner in the field, the one area where I see mistakes can be made or where there can be a gotcha is in the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility field. There is significant pressure on employers, justified, to do more in the area of enhancing diversity, increasing representation of women and minorities in positions throughout the company, and particularly in executive level positions, and also addressing pay equity and making sure people are paid fairly. Now, sometimes though, in, in the effort to do as much as you can, you see companies make mistakes. They might, you know, one thing that's really textbook Title VII law, and Commissioner Sonderling will tell you this too, is that under Title VII, you cannot engage in preferences or quotas. And yet sometimes you'll see in these uh, programs that are put together an effort to use a preference or quota, sort of a, a shortcut to trying to enhance diversity or a shortcut to pay equity. There are no shortcuts. There's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. The way to do it is to use workforce analytics to really evaluate your representation based on race and gender to get the statistics by job group, and then to set goals 
to increase outreach and recruitment over time. That's classic affirmative action in employment. There's a way to do it. And in fact, it's great to see more companies doing that, even non-federal contractors adopting voluntary affirmative action programs or their equivalent. Same in the area of pay equity. There is a pay gap in this com- country that's significant. The fact that there's a pay gap alone, though, does not justify paying people based on race or gender or giving them a raise solely because of their race, ethnicity, or gender. No. What you need to do is you need to assess pay, looking for pay disparities, uh, controlling for all the factors a company uses to set pay. You need to do those analytics. You need to do a regression analysis, potentially, and then determine what are actionable pay disparities, and that's what you go in and fix. So, you know, I just use those as two illustrations. And it would apply in the area of artificial intelligence as well. You want companies, you want providers, vendors, you want everyone in this field doing the work they need to do to make sure that they can show that they're having an impact, that they're improving diversity, they're improving pay equity, and at the same time, that they're doing it in a legal way, not through preferences or quotas. I think this is so important. This is an area where when I'm out there, I see people doing things because they feel like it's the right thing to do. And they feel like they can't really go wrong if their heart is in the right place. And that's <laughs> that's absolutely not accurate. So I'm so glad you brought up this point. It, it's all about advancing equal opportunity in the workplace. That everyone should have a fair shot to earn a living. I mean, it's going down to the fundamental civil rights to enter and thrive in the workplace. And from our perspective at the EEOC, we're trying to advance that equal opportunity to make um, make sure employment decisions that people can enter in the workplace and that they succeed in the workplace, not based on their race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, pregnancy, national origin, actually on their merit. And, you know, as you heard uh, Craig talk about, we've recently now started a new initiative with the Department of Labor called the Higher Initiative to start talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion programs that are um, largely being uh, very popular in, in corporate America and talk about how we can increase um, diversity in the workforce in a lawful way. And I think that's the key. Yeah, and using analytics in your DEI programs, I think people tend to think, well, it would be great if we could do that, but it's it's absolutely mandatory to do that if, if I consider what you're saying correctly, which is that you can't just have these programs out there and they're showing preferences and they're, they're trying to help people along. And again, people's hearts are in the right place, but there is a legal and a non-legal way to do this. And I think for me personally, that's a major takeaway from this conversation, just talking to a lot of HR professionals. Right. And, it, and it's on us and the federal government to make sure that employers are doing it right. And an employee knows that what their employer's obligations are when designing and administering these programs. Yeah, no, no, wonderful, wonderful advice. Thank you both. So let's move gears a little bit um, into the pandemic. I'm personally curious about how the pandemic itself change the EO landscape and what new considerations have come into play. Keith, can we start with you on that one? Yeah, sure. And, you know, I think it it fundamentally changed the workforce as a whole. And there's a lot of different ways to look at this. There's the practical side, which you write about, and I really enjoy reading. And there's also the legal side that, that I'm concerned with here now, too. So some things that may be legal now um, may not be the best business decision. And there are two different uh, conversations. But from what we're concerned about here is that in a way, you know, after the financial crisis every in 2008, everyone talked that the CFO was the CEO's uh, best friend going through that process. With COVID, the chief human resource officer suddenly became the CEO's best friend. And the HR issues that we've been dealing with here at the EEOC since the 1960s, we're, we're now at the forefront of board of directors and CEOs' minds, which is important because, again, they're dealing with the fundamental civil rights. But as far as the actual COVID implication, there's just so many waves of, uh, of not necessarily different variants, but different HR issues that came with it. So, you know, for, so first, when the lockdowns were happening, we talked about on um, the EEOC how to 
talk about telework and you know accommodations to to perform your work outside of the workplace or for those who couldn't telework like in retail or grocery stores when they had to come in how do you protect your worker safety and also protect um, the customers that are coming in so we had to first talk about that and then there was uh, the vaccine development came out uh, under emergency use authorization so then we had to start talking about the shift of can you allow uh, mandatory vaccination programs can you incentivize your employees to get vaccinated. So that was the next biggest thing is that the vaccine's out now. Can we pay our employees, give them time off or give them a present? So there's obviously legal issues associated with all that. So we had to adapt to that. And then when we thought there were going to be widespread federal or state mandatory policies, we had to then talk about, well, what are the longstanding accommodations employers have had to give to employees who can't get the vaccine because of a disability, because of a religion, or because of a pregnancy? So there's always a new issue. So then once, you know, the mandatory vaccination um, programs were either, you know, went into play or they, or they didn't, what was the next issue? Then it turned into long haul COVID. And how do we address that? So how do I now deal with an employee who uh, was sick with COVID on a ventilator versus an employee who didn't even know they had COVID, but they're both COVID survivors? How do we accommodate them in the workplace? And then returning to work. How are we returning? How are we deciding who to return to work? And how is that going to affect different classes of workers, of some people who may not have the luxury of working from home that have to come in? And are there any you know, there, it may be discriminatory about if you're bringing back certain groups of people and not others. So the EEOC always had to be on the forefront of this to give out new guidance. But really, now, if we look at the whole landscape, what's the newest issue? It's now related to caregivers and ongoing issues with that. And we've put out guidance on that. So to answer your question, really, I would say the landscape has changed when it really comes to other obligations outside of doing your work. COVID has shown that employees can work from home if they're allowed to, and they can in their job, and still potentially take care of their children when childcare was closed, or take care of elderly parents. And what are employers' obligations not to discriminate on some of those basis related to caregiver responsibilities? And now we talked about that although caregiving is not a protected characteristic, the stereotypes of caregivers now moving forward in the future of work is. So if you're saying that I'm not going to give this woman, the opportunity to travel and get lucrative business contracts because she has young kids at home and now they're homeschooled because their school still has COVID issues, you know, that's gender discrimination. So there's just so many new issues that have arisen from COVID that has fundamentally changed the landscape. But I'm proud to say that the EEOC has been there every step of the way, putting out up-to-date guidance on all those issues. But right now, where we are now, I would say that caregiving and the responsibility that employees have to take care of their families post-COVID is at the forefront of our minds. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a really good point about caregiving. And it's something that, let's say, 20 years ago really wasn't, I think, at, at the forefront. I'm also glad you mentioned access issues because this is something I think that in the professional world we tend to take for granted, that everybody who could potentially work from home will have a good enough internet connection or the equipment that they need. And that's not necessarily the case. And are we putting these people at a disadvantage by just assuming that they have appropriate access and can work with the collaboration tools that they need and know how to use them, et cetera? I'm also really glad you brought up bringing different groups into the office. This is something that I've been thinking a lot about in the sense of, is going into the office going to become a special privilege? And are the people who are more privileged going to get to participate in certain in-person meetings, for example? And how do you mitigate that? And I think this is a, a brave new world that none of us have really thought about before. And it's something where I think the EEOC can absolutely pitch in and help us develop guidance around. And you're absolutely right. How is that going to break down? And, and just because everyone can work remotely and just because you like working remotely, um, you know, the employer still gets to make that decision. But this is where it, it, it crosses over the line between law and, and practical business sense is that if you're going to call everyone um, back to the office five days a week, you know, with the economy the way it is and the amount of job opportunities, employees may just, you may lose your best employees. But, but the, at the same time, if you're going to say, you know, it's up to you or, you know, this group is required to come back a few days a week, how is that going to break down 
when we do an analysis of if it impacts certain minorities, if it impacts certain races, if they can't come into the office, if they can't resume business travel because some of these new responsibilities. For instance, you know, we know a lot of daycares and schools now are not back five days a week. So, you know, a caregiver, going back to that example, because I just think it's so relevant right now, may not be able to take that opportunity. So, you know, and that can lead to discrimination. So employers now, you know, we're not out of this as far as the legal responsibilities related to COVID. They're just like the vaccination, the incentives, long haul, there's always going to be something else. So it's so important to take, um, stay on top of that and to make sure that it is not unintentionally discriminating against certain groups. Because under our laws, even if you don't mean to, to uh, discriminate, if there is discrimination, there's, your employer is still going to be liable. So employers just have to be so careful with the return to work future. We've talked about some of the challenges related to remote work and you know, being able to come into the office. But I do want to take a moment to mention how much remote work is helpful from an equal employment opportunity perspective. Uh, you know, what we, in, when I was at OFCCP, we, we would always talk about the goal to really increase opportunity to, is, to, is to expand applicant flow. And what applicant flow is basically the amount of people who are able to apply to a job um, and who do apply to a job. And there's availability, which is under that, which is the amount of people that are able to. Applicant flow is the amount of people who do Availability is the amount of people who are able to. And if you expand the geographic area where you're able to, for, where people can apply and they don't have to come into the office, typically that will enhance the opportunity for, for women, for people of color, for people with disabilities in particular, to be able to work. Uh, there are a lot of, um, still in this society, sadly, there are still a lot of obstacles for people with disabilities being able to come into the workplace and work. And that's why the labor force participation rate for people with disabilities is lower. I have a daughter who's right there, Alex, with uh, profound autism, and I'm a caregiver. And I work a lot in the disability community. And I can tell you, very interesting, that the labor force participation rate for people with disabilities is at the highest ever over the last several months uh, because of uh, coming out of the pandemic, coming out of COVID, there's just been, the, the economy is growing, and there's a lot of opportunities now for people with disabilities not to have to go into the workplace. So, you know, there's always that balance there. One, it's helpful to let more people come in because you're getting more skilled workers who might not otherwise apply to your company. At the same time, like Commissioner Sonderling mentioned and like you mentioned, Alexandra, you have to think about, well, are we still giving them the same opportunity to advance in the workplace? Because, you know, maybe if we have all these meetings and we don't have a Zoom meeting attached to it, well, you know, then maybe those individuals who are at home won't be able to participate. So that's why, you know, you mentioned earlier that question, you know, is it overwhelming in a sense for HR right now? There's just so many things to think about. And that's part of the reason why. There's so many opportunities, but there's so many potential pitfalls at the same time. Yeah. And I, I mean, I have seen this play out firsthand. I have a friend who had her first child during, it was pre-COVID, so during re the regular times of, of work in person, and had, had a tough time when she was pregnant. She felt that she was discriminated against and that people thought she had one foot out the door. And during COVID, she was getting ready to have her second child, and she never had to tell anybody she was pregnant. And she right. noticed a, a really concrete <laughs> difference in the reactions that she would get from people. So that, to me, underlines what you're saying about the fact that the remote work opens up opportunities to not have our disabilities or, or whatever characteristics we have necessarily be upfront. It's our work that speaks a little bit more for itself, or at least it provides the opportunity for that. So really, really great points. We are going to uh, move on to the part of this that I think a lot of our audience is going to be excited about, and that's artificial intelligence. And Keith, I would love for you to start in telling us how you think AI facilitates fair and equal treatment of both candidates, because I know that can be a separate issue sometimes, and employees. Like, what are the benefits that you see? This is an area that's of great passion for you. So it is, and you know, since I've uh, been at the EEOC, I, I've been determined to talk about artificial intelligence to raise artificial intelligence because I believe that if, if it is carefully designed and properly used, so there's two parts to what I just said carefully designed and properly used, that AI absolutely has the potential to advance diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in the workplace. 
How do we do that? It, by mitigating the risk of unlawful discrimination. So it can help employees, employers find the best employees. It can help employers take their current workforce and show them opportunities based on their skills, um, based on uh, AI formulas of jobs that they can do, be doing so much better on. It can raise their satisfaction. It can move a lot of the historical biases away and take a skills-based approach to hiring. It can offset the well-documented confidence gap that leads women to underreport their abilities on resumes and men to overstate theirs. AI can identify a candidate's adjacent skills and it can identify candidates for those life-changing upskilling and reskilling opportunities, which is you know all the talk right now about learning and upskilling and reskilling. So in short, I believe that AI can identify the best candidates not only on their merit, but on their potential, all while stripping away human bias. So AI can also eliminate the opportunity for intentional discrimination at the earliest stages of the hiring process. So we all know the numerous studies that have shown the ways that employment decisions are vulnerable on the part of hiring professionals, which is you know part of the reason my agency exists. So one study showed that hiring managers are more likely to favor resumes featuring male names over female names, even though the resumes were otherwise identical. Another study showed that African Americans and Asian Americans who whiten their resumes, and what do I mean by that? They delete references to their race, receive more callbacks than identical applicants that included racial references. So this has obviously been a very big problem for a long time. And the issue is that HR professionals do not become aware of this discriminatory conduct till it is too late. But AI can help eliminate bias from the earliest stages of the hiring process. For example, an AI-enabled resume screening program can be taught to disregard variables that have no bearing on, the, on somebody's job performance, such as an applicant's name. Think about that. What does an applicant's name tell you about the candidate's ability to do a job? Absolutely nothing. What it tells you is the applicant's sex, their national origin, even their religion or race. So an AI-enabled bot can also help eliminate some discrimination that interviewer C, right? So for instance, in a, a, an interviewer, a human, sees that somebody else is visibly pregnant, visibly disabled, or visibly of a certain race or national origin. Again, what does that have to do with their ability to perform a job? Absolutely nothing. It can, it can eliminate all that from the earliest stages of the process. It can also mask for proxy terms like people's names, like I told you before, the names of sports teams or someone's graduation dates, all which really are not relevant. They just tell you about protected characteristics. So these are just a few of the examples where AI can eliminate bias at the earliest stages of the process by how? By eliminating the black box of that human mind, um, which can potentially cause that discrimination. So um, it can be very, very helpful, but again, only helpful if it is carefully designed and properly used, because if not, then it could potentially cause some significant issues. We do have to keep in mind that software is developed by humans. <laughs> so sometimes we have to be careful that we're not baking discrimination unknowingly um, into these programs. Correct. So that, that's why it needs to be designed properly. And the people using it have to be using it for the right purpose, to help diversify workforce, to help candidates who have not had the opportunity because of those protected characteristics by putting those aside and looking at the actual skills. And if properly designed, AI can do that. To me, when I look at, and I was the OFCCP director, I serve on the Eightfold Advisory Board. I, I've worked in the AI field as well with the Institute for Workplace Equality and in my practice. I'll tell you, the reason why I'm a big fan of AI, if done carefully and properly, as Commissioner Sonderling mentioned, is because I feel in the long run, over the next 10 years, you're going to see that if you're not using AI in employment, that's what's going to open you up to a claim of bias. And why do I say that? Because it is well documented that no matter how hard you try, that unconscious bias exists in this country and that it seeps into employment processes, particularly more decentralized ones. And that, over, and that if you're not assessing for that unconscious bias and for bias generally all the time, that it happens. Humans make mistakes. Humans do things intentionally biased. Sometimes they do it unconsciously biased. But whatever it is, that's something that can be corrected. 
can be addressed through artificial intelligence. It's helpful to have the artificial intelligence involved because ultimately the goal is, is for human beings to pick what are the factors that we're using to hire someone. What's important? What are the skills we want? What are those factors? And then instead of going through and perhaps exercising unconscious bias in reviewing different resumes and doing initial, screen, initial screening interviews, if you could have an artificial intelligence go in there and replicate that process, but not look at protected classes and make sure not to exercise that bias, then over time you will identify those people who are best for the job by definition. So really the goal is, I, I, you know, with, with artificial intelligence is to try to involve it more often, but do it in a way where you're assessing for disparate impact. Now, why do I mention disparate impact? Because as Commissioner Sonderling mentioned, artificial intelligence largely addresses disparate treatment because now you're not having people make a decision intentionally based on race or gender or any other protected class. Instead, you're having the AI come in and assist with that and remove the bias and make sure you're identifying the top people. So really then what's left is to assess potential adverse impact, bias, adverse impact. And there's ways to do that. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm on the Eightfold Advisory Board, along with uh, former chair Vicki Lipnick, who's also on the advisory board. We advise Eightfold on ways to address that. And it's important that all AI companies are doing that, because that in the end is what's going to be the success of the artificial intelligence. One, are you being successful in identifying the most talented candidates, the most skilled? Okay, that's great. Two, are you checking for bias in real time? and making sure to eliminate it. And if you're doing those two things, then you really are doing it the right way. And in the long run, you're going to have a competitive advantage over companies that don't. Yeah, yeah I think that's a great point because AI has no motives or intentions of its own. It might at some point, but it's not a science fiction movie yet. It just has those algorithms that enable to correlate data and make those predictions. And you know, according to industry experts and why AI is getting so much buzz, especially in the, uh, AI in the human resources space is because that's what makes it so attractive to employers. Its reliance on hard data creates the potential to eliminate discrimination by removing that human bias from the decision-making process. And when it is designed in a clear and explainable way, and that's really what I'm trying to emphasize, it really eliminates one of the biggest challenges HR directors have faced since the beginning of time, really, is the capriciousness of human taste. So that is, it's so critical to keep that in mind that so much of it is on the design and the data that goes into it. And that data can't be biased either. And on a related point, I love the implication for hiring for potential that AI offers. The fact is that we as HR professionals do tend to look for a candidate, for example, who can check every single box. They have the exact experience, the expertise, the skills that, that we think are needed for a job. And we end up discounting a lot of really great talent because we think that people have to have X, Y, and Z. And I love the potential of AI to say, no, actually this person could be quite capable and quite competent to do this role if you just think out of the box a little bit. And so I love the notion of adjacent skills, hiring for potential that, that AI provides. I'm going to move back to DEI for a second. Um, Craig, I'm going to ask you first on this one. Uh, this is a question that we, we get with respect to DEI. Is there a general rule that employers should aim to hire in proportionality to the diversity statistics for available folks in their population? Because employers sometimes have their own job requirements that are unique to either them as an organization or to a specific position. And that would skew the availability statistics of, of that role. So what, what are your thoughts on this? And so we'll start with Craig and then and we'll move to Keith if we have some time. So generally in the affirmative action area and DEIA generally, what a company is trying to do is over time have their workforce match the available population. So, you know, a lot of times it depends on where you are in the country, the geography, how broadly you're recruiting. Um, but you're typically looking at the percentages of women uh, and minorities in a given area, in a given job group or particular job. So you're drilling down even more than general statistics or general demographics. You're looking at what are the per percentage in, in this particular job of welder or engineer 
What are the percentage that are women that are available to take this job? Um, what are the percentage of minorities in this area? And the idea is that if you really support equal employment opportunity and you're giving everyone a fair chance over time, your workforce should, should match the available workforce. But the point is that you can't cut corners. And that's really the main point of all of this. In terms of the law, when I come in as with my lawyer hat on, I'm always reminding companies that doesn't mean that in a given situation, if you're choosing between a white candidate and a black candidate, and you know you're underrepresented as to blacks, but in this particular case, the white candidate has all the preferred qualifications and the black candidate doesn't, you don't give a preference to the black candidate based on their race. And it could be the other way around too. The black candidate could have all the preferred qualifications and the white one not, not and you don't give Obviously, you don't give a preference to the white candidate because that could be discriminatory. But more generally, you don't give it, you don't give a preference to either based on their race in that individual decision. Instead, you look at who has all the preferred qualifications, who's the stronger candidate. The idea being that based on historic discrimination, many times in the past when that decision was made, the candidate that was underrepresented wasn't chosen because of discrimination. So now if you're choosing people not based on discrimination, really based on who's the top candidate, over time, that black candidate's going to be picked proportionally the same amount as the white candidate. That's the thinking behind this idea. It's never engaging in a preference or trying to put your thumb on the scale. It's making sure, ultimately, that the black candidate has the same chance as the white candidate to get that job, that the woman candidate has the same chance as the, the male candidate to get the job, that the person with a disability has a real opportunity to get the job. That's what you're trying to do through equal employment opportunity. And, and you know, in the, in the end, in a nutshell, it's simple. It's about expanding opportunity. It's not about putting your thumb on the squ a scale so you get a particular outcome in a particular case. Yeah, I, I think that was a really important point to reiterate. And Craig, how do you think AI can help us in deciding what the job requirements should be. Keeping this notion of, of preference in mind, we don't want to do that. We want to have really concrete requirements that we can put out there. So I, I guess it's a little bit of a, of a nuance here. You don't want to be too specific because you do want to offer the ability to hire for potential, but you also want to be fair in terms of who can do the best job in a particular role. Yeah, so AI can help you identify underrepresented groups that have not before perhaps applied for a particular job in a given area or have done it in an underrepresented way. And it can help you identify those candidates and make sure that you're getting an applicant flow, which I mentioned before, that's broader and that's more diverse. That's one thing AI can do. Another thing AI can do is it can help you identify the stronger candidates based on merit and merit alone by taking away any ability to consider protected class basis in selection. And one other thing it can do is in real time, you can go back and assess whatever, uh, whatever parameters, whatever priorities, whatever job qualifications you're setting, you can go and assess, well, was that particular qualification, was that necessary? Did we get strong candidates out of that? How did it affect our applicant flow? Did it end up causing some sort of adverse impact to, uh, to a minority group, to, to women, to people with disabilities? And if you find that, then you can adjust it and you can say, you know what? We don't really need that qualification. We're losing a lot of people for this qualification. So when we list this job again, we're not going to do that anymore. So in that sense, AI can help you at every stage of the process. It can help you with affirmative action and DEI by identifying more candidates who have traditionally not been identified. And at the selection phase, picking the best candidate based on merit. Everything that Craig just talked about, it's based on data. And HR data is everything. It makes the difference between a good hire or a, a bad hire. And what I'm trying to raise awareness of is a discriminatory hire. So I think, you know, anything that can assist employers in technology to help them sift through this data to help diversify their workforce in a legal and compliant way, we should all be very excited about and we should all really work to make sure it's designed properly in accordance um, with these laws. So moving a little bit to the global side of things, um, EEOC deals with U.S. regulations, obviously, um, but remote work has taken the employee base increasingly international. So Keith, can you share a little bit about how EEOC 
interacts with international employee bases and maybe other governments? Well, the issues related to um, the future of work and especially artificial intelligence are really global now with employees, uh, US-based employers and global employers using artificial intelligence with having employees all over the world. So it, it's much more than just the United States now. So the, the technology that's being designed, developed and deployed here in the USA is going across the world. So we have an opportunity now as regulators to work together because the regulation related to artificial intelligence either doesn't exist or is in its infancy, we have a unique time because this software is being used across the globe for employees across the globe, um, either working for American or international based companies. You know, everyone agrees that none of them should be discriminated against no matter where they are. And it sure shouldn't be made worse um, by technology. So you're seeing a lot of action in the EU related to regulating artificial intelligence here in the United States. Obviously, the EEOC and other agencies are very interested in this, but so far it's been very fragmented. You're starting to see states like New York or Illinois um, come out with their, and California come out with their pros, uh, proposals. But I've you know really argued that this needs to be done holistically that we're still at a critical point here where regulation can really spur innovation in this area and can really help make sure that people's, again, most fundamental civil rights to thrive in the workplace, to be able to earn a living, are protected with technology designed properly in accordance with our longstanding civil rights laws, whether it's occurring here in the United States, in Buenos Aires, in Beijing, or anywhere. It doesn't matter. The, these laws should still apply and the technology should be developed with our values, our ethics and our laws in mind. So I do think it's a global issue. And I really think we're on the cusp of that, of everyone um, taking this up and trying to work together. Mm -hmm. Regulation for good. I love it. Absolutely. Craig, final thoughts on, on the global issue. You know, the United States economy is the leading economy in the world and we should be the lead in AI, in my view. Uh, that will make sure that we're getting the most talented people to the best jobs, and we're doing it in a way that doesn't discriminate. That's the goal, and the United States needs to be at the lead, in my view, worldwide on this topic. Excellent. Well, thank you. Well, we are coming up on time for this panel, which is very disappointing to me because I am just mesmerized by all of the wisdom and guidance that you both are providing. But as a workforce futurist, I have to ask, of course, and I want you, this is a lightning round, so I want you to answer this as, as quickly and succinctly as you can. Just first thing that comes to mind, where do you see the EO discipline in 10 years? Like, what do we need to do as a society to make that positive future a reality? So we'll start with Commissioner Keith Sagan. So as I started earlier, since the pandemic and, and since the unfortunate news of the Me Too movement, of racial inequity, everything that's really come to our attention in the national news has raised the profile of Human Resources Department. No longer are, are cost centers, they're now business partners making very valuable decisions that are affecting employees' well-being, which is in fact, which is improving overall profitability of companies. So I think this is this the whole EO discipline now is big ticket stuff. It's national news. It's in corporate boardrooms. And I think that's really a good thing. But also it's on the EEOC and me as a regulator to ensure that no matter what technology is being used, no matter what decisions about the future of work are being made, that they still comply with the longstanding civil rights laws from the 1960s. Because our laws may be old, but they are not outdated. Regulators need to work with business more. You know, the days of having this adverse relationship with business doesn't work, it's ineffective, and ultimately companies should be working with the regulator and vice versa because companies get it. Companies see that diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility is incredibly important. So give more guidance, work with companies more, do what Commissioner Sandra Ling is doing, come and speak more often to companies and help them. That is terrific. Well, I personally have learned so much from both of you gentlemen today. Um, the issue of preference is one that I'm really going to take away, that we just have to be as objective as possible in selecting people for the right roles and that we can use artificial intelligence to help us do that. The fact that um, we need to have a partnership between business and regulators in order to keep up with increasing demands and help HR professionals get the policies that they need into place and that uh, the EEOC in particular would like to hear from all of us in terms of 
what we are experiencing out in the field and how these some of these new regulations are affecting different types of industries and organizations. So with that, we have come to time. I would like to thank so much Commissioner Keith Sonderling and Craig Lean for joining me here and as well as Eightfold and Cultivate for having us here. It's been a wonderful opportunity and I look forward to hearing from everyone who is participating in terms of what you felt, what you think, and what you'd like to hear about next.